So I do welcome um, uh, Mr. Kappers uh, to speak to us today. And uh, he, he is currently also working with Lighthouse as the Chaplain Emeritus and is very much involved uh, and keeping the, the mission on track. It was 1981, 43 years ago, when, uh, when Tuus was called to be the first chaplain for Lighthouse Harbor Ministries. And he's here still all these years later. So welcome to, we look forward to hearing what you have to say to us. Thank you. I never used to walk with a stick, but I thought if Moses could do it, I can do it. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for your very kind invitation. This is the first time I've come to your church. I've been in this building with Bible Study Fellowship, the men's group, for quite some time, uh, but that was also quite a few years ago. I like to start off with um, a honeymoon story. Uh, next Sunday, that will be our wedding anniversary, and we will be married for 52 years. So if you are on your way to 50... <laughs> You can thank my wife, she, she's the one, the patient one with me. Um, but I'd like to start off with a story because it, it stayed in our minds and it will never leave us. Uh, after our first night as a married couple, we were staying in a very small little hotel in the middle of the forest in Holland, in a small village. And uh, actually the place was in the middle of nowhere. Um, but it was a very nice place and uh, in the morning early when we woke up like it had already become our tradition we would pray together and I hope if you are a couple that you are in the habit of praying together because it is very powerful you can't be enemies for too long if you pray together you have to be able to forgive each other but anyways, we woke up and we were sitting on the side of our bed and we started praying when we heard flattering of something on the windowsill. The window was open, it was a beautiful day, 1st of September, and it was like an Indian summer there uh, in Holland. And uh, we noticed there was this beautiful white dove which had come onto the windowsill. And I got up and got this dove and both of us, we stroked it. And we said, Lord, thank you for sending us such a wonderful uh, endorsement of our marriage and that you are the one who has brought us together. And so with that blessing, we let the dove go. And I am sure the dove isn't around anymore today. But um, it was a real blessing for us because we knew God was going to bless us in our lives. We met in Bible college in uh, Swansea. Maria originally is from East Germany, which used to be communist, and I'm from Holland. And um, we both met in Wales, in Swansea. If you've ever read a book called Rhys Howell's Intercessor, it's a very interesting, I can recommend you look up that book. It's a very extraordinary story about a re revival situation in Wales which happened in 19-something in the early 1900s. But uh, we were in that Bible college that was started as a result of that revival by a man called Rhys Howells. And uh, that's where we met. Now there was a very strong um, law written there uh, about the talking of male and females together. We were not supposed to talk. Males had to be absolutely separate from females. Um, being a Dutchman, I'm a rebel. And uh, when Maria and I met, 
uh, I won't tell you the whole story. You can look it up in our book, actually, uh, what we did. But I asked Maria to marry me. And uh, here we are, 52 years later. And we're still married and happily married and looking forward to the coming of the Lord because we know that day is coming soon. So while I was a student in Bible college, I went to uh, walk on the beach, which was quite nearby our college. And I noticed this ship coming into the port. And I thought, hmm, maybe I can go and talk to these sailors. And I found my way to the port and I noticed it was a ship from the then Soviet Union. And I had tracts in my pocket in Russian language. So I went on board that ship and um, started to give out. It was a Saturday afternoon. Uh, I started to give out to some of the crew on deck. And when they discovered what it was, they got very excited and angry and threw the tracts overboard in the water. And because I'm a big, I wasn't, I didn't have this part, but I was always strong. Uh, they didn't think about, you know, throwing me overboard. But uh, they made in no uncertain terms sure that I was going to leave their ship. But it was maybe the best reaction I could have had. Because, you know, when a person tells you not to do something, I want to do it. I want to find a way how I can go and share the gospel. That's good for you to know too, because if you want to go and become a preacher of the gospel, wherever this may be in the world, you will find opposition. You will find hardship. You will find times that you feel like giving up or think it's of no use. Don't give up. Because if God has given you a vision, then go and do what God wants you to do. And so for most of my free afternoons as a student, I would go to to the port, and I would visit any ship, just whatever nationality. And I found out that, you know, sailors were very uh, open, not like the Russians at the time, but uh, very open to the gospel. And uh, I continued doing that till I finished my Bible college, or our Bible college. And uh, then we got married, and we didn't think ever that this was going to become our future ministry. I had no idea. But cutting a long story short, we received an invitation from an organization in London called the London City Mission. This was in the early 70s then. And they invited us to become the chaplains to seafarers in the port of Tilbury, which is just east of London. And uh, when I started to read up on this mission, uh, I thought, no, all, I'd seen pictures of the missionaries. They were all wearing English bowler hats. And I thought, that looks stupid to me. I mean, I'm, not, I'm already 6'7". I don't need another you know, few inches on top of me. Um, and um, when I just you know, looked at the mission and the background, I thought, no, that's, that's not for us. But you know, Maria, very wise, said, you know, we've been praying for Siemens ministry. We've been praying for a home, because Maria was expecting our first uh, baby. And um, we had been praying for a mission. And so all these three prayers really were answered at once. And I said, okay, if this is what God wants us to do, let's go and have a look and further investigate. So we were there actually for nine years, and nine happy years. They were tough. I mean, the area was disgusting. It was the worst kind. It's like, you know, East Vancouver near Hastings and main area. A lot of, uh, no drugs in those days yet, but a lot of drunkenness and a lot of troublemakers. And um, a place where you really don't want to bring up a family. But you know, God blessed us there. And we literally saw hundreds of hundreds of sailors from all over the world coming uh, to faith in Christ because of our testimony there. And it was really nice. Sometimes uncomfortable because at three or four in the morning, there will be a knock at our door, the doorbell rang, and there will be a sailor who had just arrived with his ship in the port, just to come and say, good morning, I've arrived. I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> at this time of the morning, yes, yeah, well, we just like to see you and be with you. In those days, 
a lot of sailors, in particular those from African countries, were especially no, not officers but crew, they were illiterate. And uh, if they were Christians, they couldn't read scripture. So all they wanted to do us, that we did, were, was to read scripture to them. And uh, it was our privilege to do that. Sometimes sailors were baptized. We didn't do it ourselves, but in a, in a local church there. And we've seen God at work in a, in a miraculous way. And we were settled in Britain. And then, again, it's a long story what happened, but um, uh, we were invited to come and start a new organization here in Vancouver, Lighthouse Harbor Ministries. It didn't have a name in those days yet. We just started off. Um, we were here um, almost by accident. I met uh, different people I wasn't supposed to meet, but it was God's timing. And uh, they invited us to come here and work and set up a new ministry with them uh, called Lighthouse Harbor Ministries. And so 41 years ago now, 40 two years ago, 43 years ago almost, uh, we came to Vancouver, not knowing what was going to happen. But very soon uh, after we arrived, we got some gifts coming in. Actually, a church that was quite close by here, 20th and somewhere, uh, closed their doors. And they came uh, to one of our prayer meetings, which we started, and they came to bring I think it was $75,000 for the establishment of a new semen center. And my, that was a blessing. And uh, so we knew we were on the right track. It was tough because we left our family and friends behind in Europe. And uh, living here in Canada was a long way from, from everyone. And we had no new friends yet. And, but God blessed us even here. And so we started looking around, the board, the committee, they said, okay, well, let's go and look around for buildings on the North Shore. And again, cut a long story short, we came across this particular building in which we are still today, uh, which we opened the doors in 1985, Christmas Day, 85. And um, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of sailors have been through those doors already by now. And uh, it didn't only stay with the North Vancouver Center, and the Lord added to our number in staff members, in, uh, in other chaplains, and uh, with an administrator. And so we were able to establish a Siemens ministry on the West Coast. We also looked at another place, uh, Prince Rupert. And uh, after an initial trial that fell flat because of people couldn't work together at the time, some people there. And uh, we thought, oh, well, maybe we should never look at Prince Rupert again. But we, you know, after about a year or two, we got a phone call from Prince Rupert again and said a couple who had just arrived there, they saw those sailors walking on the street in Prince Rupert. And uh, they said, is anybody looking after these sailors? And they said, no, but there was a couple here they tried to set up a ministry. Well, who are they? And so I got this phone call from Prince Rupert, and they said, can you come over and help us? Set up the ministry here. I said, sure we can. So Marie and I went together uh, a few days later and spent, I think, a week or so there, and a new mission was started, Lighthouse Harbor Ministries, Prince Rupert, which now has its own full-time chaplain, Izito, and Zito comes from the Philippines, and he is a full-time minister. One of the problems that Prince Rupert has is that there are not too many workers, not too many volunteers. I don't know what Lighthouse Vancouver could do without volunteers, but you do, because we have so many of them. Um, but in Prince Rupert, there are you know population much smaller. The number of Christians is smaller as well. And so, you know, what do you do? Um, I was interesting. But they continued going on, and they still today, they have their own building, which uh, is owned by Lighthouse Harbor Ministries Vancouver, but we're leasing it to them for a dollar per year. And so they're happy to use it and uh, to win sailors 
to Christ. That's our main aim. Our purpose is to preach the gospel to seamen of all nations. I said to Rob earlier on, Rob is a very faithful board member and worker on the ships as well. I said, you know, in the very beginning, we made an agreement with the Lord. I don't know if you ever made agreements with the Lord. We've done it in our lives, um, even in our married life. But um, we said, Lord, if ever we stop preaching the gospel, please shut us down. Now, that's quite something because it means that if we would actually stop, you would say, oh, they will never stop preaching the gospel. I tell you there are many organizations or Siemens missions even where they used to preach the gospel and they quit. They stopped. Like many churches where they stopped preaching the gospel, where Christ did not become central and remain central in, in the message. And today most of those places are shut. I know from my own hometown in Holland where there were four churches of a particular denomination where I grew up and they stopped preaching the gospel. Christ was not centered. Today, where there were thousands of people attending their services, nobody, actually most of those churches have been demolished and the only one that is remaining is being used as a museum. So this is what can happen. We committed them to preaching the gospel. We want to do that because we know that without the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no hope of salvation. We can pray and preach whatever we like, but it doesn't work. We must have Christ central. We must have him as our aim of proclaiming the message of salvation. So it's been exciting. Then some years, quite some years ago now, uh, Marie and I thought, you know, we hear about these cruise ships coming not only to Vancouver, but to Victoria. And so we went down to Victoria and um, out of the back of our, we found a place where the cruise ships come to, it's called Ogden Point. And um, we thought, oh, let's go and see what we can do to the crew of the cruise ships. Because cruise ships today will have approximately 1,000 crew on board. There's a lot of people. And uh, most of them, besides doing some shopping, have really nowhere to go. So it was in our vision and our mind to set up a center there. But, you know, it's only seasonal because cruise ships only come from uh, April to October. And that's finished for the winter months. So we approached the Harbor Commission and we, um, we said we would like to set up some ministry here and help for the seafarers. And they said, okay, we like that. We would encourage you to do that. And uh, so we purchased a very large tent, a marquee, a marquee tent. And we set it up right at Ogden Point, right in between where the ships are. And if you would go there tonight or even today, right now, you will find sailors there. Some nights they have over a hundred people in that place. They come and the good thing about those ships is they're on a regular run between Alaska and Seattle and they stop over in Victoria. So it is really helpful in, in follow-up work and building up contacts. Whereas our ministry here in Vancouver and even in Prince Rupert is uh, of sailors who come and we might never see them again. And of course the ships, the cargo ships are much smaller. There may be only 22 men on board and not more. Well, time would not be sufficient for me to go and explain how many sailors we have reached over the years, how many Bibles we have given out, and how many of our staff have gone and, and prayed with these men, uh, and sometimes women, on board the ships. Uh, because we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is the answer. Sometimes you don't know who's coming in. Last Wednesday, for instance, at the Fraser Surrey Dock, that's the place where I still work most of the time. Um, we have a center there. And um, uh, the, some Indian crew came in. Actually, they were already there before I arrived, before six o'clock. 
and uh, they were quite happy to chat. They had the time till about eight o'clock, and then I had to go back on duty. But one man st stuck behind with me, and we started to talk. He's 22 years old. It's the first time at sea. He's been only seven months on a ship, so that's not very long. And um, he is a Hindu. That's his background. He brought up in the Hindu religion. And I asked him, have you ever heard stories about Jesus? He said, no, never. So you begin. I mean, where do you begin? So I said, well, i like to tell you a story of one of the stories that Jesus said, because Jesus often spoke in stories, parables, to illustrate some, some tremendous truth. And I told him the story about the prodigal son. And I was just sitting spellbound listening. He says, I've never heard that. And so we gave him a Marinus New Testament. That's a little New Testament specially adapted for seafarers. And uh, he will start reading. And many sailors have received God's word. We've, I've lost count of hundreds of thousands of New Testaments and Bibles and Gospels we've given out to sailors. And what happens? One occasion, a sailor, somebody from our team, had given him a, a New Testament. And uh, I, we have no idea who it was. But he went to sea from the Philippines. He went back, uh, you know, from Vancouver to wherever he was living or going. And there he started reading God's Word for the first time ever seriously. And he said, his own testimony is, I found Jesus by reading the Word of God. Now, unfortunately, maybe fortunately, very timely, he had an accident and he could not go back to sea anymore. He had an accident on the ship and um, he stayed home and he went to study theology. He went to a, a Bible college in, in Manila and there he got uh, graduated as a pastor for missions and so he started his own church outside in an outside village area and today he has a congregation of something like 80, 90 people and started other uh, churches in other places. And so this is happening because somebody gave him God's word. If you give out God's word, have some pamphlets in your pocket or, or in your car that you can give to people because it's good for people to be able to read God's word. Again, I said, you don't know what happens when you go on board a ship. I was on a ship one day where, from Brazil, and I came into the, the cabin of the captain, and he looked right miserable. And I said, Captain, you're not happy today. No, he said, I'm not very, he spoke English. He said, I'm not very happy, I'm very miserable, he said. So I said, can I help you? No, he said, you can't help me. I said, well, if you don't tell me what your misery is about, I for sure can't help you. But if you tell me, who knows what happens? He said, you're sure? I said, yeah. So he called one of the other offices to come to his office, to his office. And um, he said something in the, in the Brazilian, the Portuguese language. And that guy indicated that I should follow him. And he took me midship to a strong room which had no windows, it was there for instruments and cables and whatever you need on deck. And so he said, do you really want to help us? I said, yeah. But at that time I didn't know whether I was really willing to help because I don't, didn't know what the plan was. So he opened this door, uh, keys and uh, locks and, and, and bolts and everything. And I thought, oh, maybe I should run away now. This is not a good place to be. Uh, so he opened the door a little bit, and then he literally pushed me in. And I thought, oh no, what did I do? I was stupid to say I can help. And um, then the door closed behind me. That's it. Well, if you've ever been to a place which is pitch dark, where there is no window, but you can sense there are other people there, and I thought maybe there are other missionaries who tried to help. Who knows what happened? But uh, after my eyes got used to the dark, I noticed there were four other guys there. And uh, 
I asked them if they spoke English. They said yes, and then their English was reasonably good. And I said, what do you do here? They said, uh, well, and then they told me their story. They'd been stowaways on that ship ever since the ship had been to Kenya. And he said, they said, we'd come to the ship because we wanted to escape from our country and hope to come to America. I said, well, you're not in America now. And they said, well, we know that. So they went from, actually from Kenya, uh, a few days out, they were discovered. And usually sometimes what happens, the captain will throw these guys overboard. If you can swim for a few days, you're lucky, but of course nobody can. But this captain was good. He did not throw them overboard. And instead he just let them be on the ship. And they had to help. Mr. the crew was cleaning and stuff, and he would feed them. And the ship came to Taiwan. And he thought he would be able to, you know, unload his people there. But the Taiwan government says, oh no, uh, they're not Taiwanese. And by the way, you have four more men, you need an additional lifeboat on your ship. That's a lot of money. And so they were salespeople. They, and so they had they no other choice. They wanted to leave the port at and have another lifeboat. So they got another lifeboat. You can understand that the company, the Brazilian company, was not pleased with the captain. Why didn't you get rid of these men? But the captain had a, a, a bad feeling if he would do that. So they came to the United States, the country of desire for so many. And uh, three men jumped overboard in the river. This was near uh, Portland. And all three were picked up by the Coast Guard, which meant that they were taken back to the ship and the, the shipping company was fined in those days about $30,000 per illegal entry into the country. And that's not being paid by the ship jumpers, but by the shipping company. This was bad news, worse. So by that time, they locked them up into this stronghold on, on the midship. And um, they said, this is where we are now. And they said, they asked me, where are we now? I said, you're in Canada, in Vancouver. Oh, he said, far from America? I said, no, but you're not going to get to America from here. And they weren't allowed to come out of that shed. And so they, they said, can you help us to get off the ship? I said, well, I don't know, but I'll try. When is your ship? Well, I went back to the captain. I banged on the door and I, um, they took me back to the captain. I said, captain, I will try to get these men off your ship. He didn't believe me. I didn't even believe myself, to be quite honest. But I was glad to leave that ship. But I felt I had to at least try. So I found an immigration lawyer who was very keen. I mean, this was business for him. So he went, I said, you have two hours before the ship sails. He went immediately from his office to the ship and he took off those four men under police guard. And uh, they were locked up so the ship could sail. I never heard of the captain anymore again, but I'm sure he was very, very pleased. Because if that ship would have sailed from Vancouver to Brazil, that was going to be the next port, they would not have arrived home. And I tell you, it has happened many a times that stowaways were just thrown overboard, which is very sad for the stowaways, of course, but also for the guilty feeling of, of the ones who did it. Anyways, after a couple of days, I thought, you know, I have to visit these men wherever they are. And I found out the jail in which they were being held. And I went in Richmond somewhere. And uh, so I went down there, uh, um, loaded with ammunition, that's my, New Testaments, and uh, I came and I was allowed to see them, all four at the same time, and I was sitting behind one side of the barbed stuff, the um, walls, and the other guys, they were literally in prison, they were on the other side, and we could talk openly, 
And men, I've never, I've been in prison visits before, but the people generally look pretty miserable. But these guys smiled. I mean, they had the biggest smiles you could imagine. I said, you look happy. Oh, we're very happy. I said, why are you happy? Well, they said, now here in prison, they ask us, what do you like to eat for breakfast? Do you like to watch television? Or do you like to play basketball? Do you want any newspapers? And so they said, never any time in our lives has anybody asked us these things. We were part of a, of a gang. And we had to rob people in order to sustain ourselves. That's how we, but now they ask us what we would like to eat. I said, yeah, you, you live now a life of luxury compared to where you were. But uh, I said, you're in prison, you see. You're still locked up. It's like a bird in a cage. You know, the bird can sing very nice like a canary would, but he's still in a cage. And these guys were, were locked up. They said, well, we're very happy. And um, that was the last time I saw them. I think that Canada sent them back home uh, to their own country. I've, of course, never heard again. You might know in eternity what happened to these men. But you know, it's amazing. What, what really has spoken to me is that you can be as happy as can be in this world and yet be in jail. You can be imprisoned in the prison of sin. You may be in, an imprisoner, a prisoner held there by Satan himself and he won't let go unless Jesus comes in and sets you free. And that is the message which we've given to seafarers over all these years. Some sailors are very sad when they come to Vancouver because uh, they get bad news. You know, in the olden days, I can talk about the olden days now, 50 years ago, when we first started to get involved in Siemens ministry, sailors couldn't correspond with home except through letter writing. And uh, then it became that sometimes they could phone if there was somebody in the neighborhood who had a phone and he had to do time and charges and all that stuff more. And then it became better, the phone cards came along and they could use phone cards to phone home and more people got phones and then they started to have the cell phones or laptops. And uh, all those things we provided for in the Lighthouse Siemens centers. They could use free of charge. And um, I, at the, in the beginning, never thought it would be ever possible for a seaman to talk on this little cell phone about half, quarter of the size of this, and talk to your family at home. I said, oh, no, that will never happen. Today is the most normal thing. You know, when you go to our Victoria Center at the cruise ship center, you will find sometimes over 100 people sitting there, absolute silence. They're all whispering and talking with their families because it's one way of communicating. Well, communication is wonderful, but it also can bring great sadness. Like what happened to this captain, uh, Captain oh, what it, Tony. And uh, I met Tony for the first time. And he came to the lighthouse at the Fraser Surrey Dock just a few weeks ago. And he just had to unburden himself how he had found out when he was at sea, uh, I think his ship was near Africa, somewhere, that his wife had died away because of, had died because of COVID. He never could say bye-bye to her, never could see her, never could be at a funeral even. They didn't have funerals in those days. I mean, that's only a few months ago because of so many people dying of COVID. And it was unbelievable how how he had suffered. He couldn't even go home because he was with his ship in the middle of the ocean and he had to wait. And you know, he couldn't even come back home because his airport was shut down. All the airports in the Philippines were shut down. And so it was a tragic event how he lost his wife and he couldn't do anything about it. And when he did come home, the only thing he found was his wedding ring, his wedding band, her wedding band because she, all the people in those days there were cremated. And uh, because so many had died, 
you know, there was no, no farewells, no services, nothing. And so sailors go through hard times or they go through very happy times when they talk to their wives and they say, oh, we've got a baby. And so some say they're so happy, oh, we've got a baby. And I asked, was it a boy or a girl? <gasps> I forgot to ask. <laughs> <coughs> but it's happy times. We meet those two. And so that's the work of our ministry to see first. If you're interested to come and join us, I would suggest you talk to Rob, uh, because he is very much involved in the ministry. And he will maybe even take you on board ship. I don't know if you do that. But uh, he will take probably people on board ship just to give you an idea of what it is like to visit seafarers. It's exciting. It's wonderful. And at the first ship ever I had been on, I never thought that this would happen. But you know what God does is good. Because he has a purpose for it. And quite honestly, I know that we are at the end part of our ministry. <laughs> We're not, not 20 years old anymore. And, but I know that it's been good to be able to serve God. It's been very wonderful. One of my old pastors, who wasn't a God-fearing man, when I told him I was going into mission, he said, how are you going to make money? And I really didn't know. I never thought about that. Even my old boss said, I'm not going to send money to you wherever you are going to work. I said, I realize that. And then he asked me this question. Do you think the ravens of Elijah are still alive? And if you know the story, when Elijah was in hiding, you know, God sent ravens to bring him food. So he said, are the ravens, are they still alive? I said, no. And I didn't know the answer, but I found out after all these years, that although the ravens have died, the God who sent the ravens is still alive today. He is alive. And he meets all our needs. When God says go, he gives you the means and all the supplies you need from day to day. We had once a unique situation in, and that's the last of the stories. Uh, we went to Costco. You know, Costco has these little cafeterias on the side, and Marie and I were having our lunch there. And the guy next to us was writing and busy looking on his phone and writing more. And so I was curious. He was very close nearby us. And so I asked him, I said, are you working for Costco? He said, oh, no, I work for myself. Oh, I said, what do you do? He said, I work the stock market. So he was making transactions right there on his phone while he was having some lunch at Costco. So I said, that really pays off. Yes, he said, that's how I make my money. And then he asked me, he said, how do you make money? So I said, I don't. He says, look, your buggy is full. You must make money somehow. I said, oh yeah, well, and I said, um, we have a very rich father. Oh, he said, and I said, you know, whenever we need something, we ask him and he always gives it to us. No lack already for many years. Wow, he said, just like that. I said, just like that. He said, do you think your father would adopt me? Maria was very sharp. She says, of course he would, but you have to ask him because we are also adopted. You are also adopted children. Sure, we are adopted children. You are those adopted children as well. You are adopted because you're part of God's family. If you love Jesus today, you're part of his family. And he has promised to meet all your needs according to his riches in glory in heaven. He is able to supply whatever your need will be. He is not a Father Christmas. He will meet your needs. And if you are walking with the Lord, as we have discovered, you will never lack anything. Lighthouse is not in debt. But we have three, four centers now. 
we are not in debt because God has always met our need. He is a great God. The thousands of Bibles that we have, a literature that we've given away, we've always been able to purchase. God is very, very good. But I'd like to read to you uh, from Romans. We already had a Romans reading, so I'm jumping ahead of your schedule. I'm sorry about it. I didn't know you had this reading. But uh, I wanted to read to you from Romans chapter 13. And it's from the New International uh, Version. And it says on the, the heading of this particular uh, scripture reading, Submission to Governing Authorities. That's sometimes tough, I think. That's why Paul uh, decided to write about it, I think, for uh, even to help us. But this is what it says in verse 13 in uh, in in uh, chapter 13, or chapter, first one, chapter 13. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right. But for those who do wrong, do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, he is afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoers. Therefore it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. Wow. For the authorities are God's servants, who give the full time to governing. Give to everyone you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. May the Lord help us to understand it. Now, we're living at a time where, I have to be honest, we don't always agree with our local authorities, or with our national authorities or provincial authorities. But take heart, you have well, a good chance this year to vote for a new government if you're not happy with the government in the province we have today. Does it mean that this government we have today was not ordained by God? I believe it was ordained by God, based on the very verses that we've read here. I have to be honest, you know, I've struggled sometimes with these thoughts that God set these people up over us. And you know, I say this between tongue and cheek, and I don't mean it in any bad way, but sometimes I, think, I would like to say, God, I can do a better job by appointing different people in authority. But that is really, really bad to think that way, because it means I'm not trusting what God has done. Even if the people who are in authority over me, God has ordained, has set up, because this is what it says very clearly. And the Apostle Paul, when he wrote this, it was the Roman Empire. Those people, the Roman emperors, were not sweethearts. They were ruthless. They were hard. They were just something. That's why the whole of Israel at the time was looking for Jesus as a redeemer against all these authorities. But that's not why Jesus had come. In the country next to us, they're in the full swing of a, of a big election. And um, maybe you have made your choice. I have made a choice. If I would be a US citizen and I would have to vote, I wouldn't vote for either. I just couldn't. And based on, on, on their beliefs, um, you know, I've had times, even living here in Canada, which has been now over 40 years, 
um, that I could not vote for a good conscience because the person in my writing was not a good person and uh, had a bad record. Maybe the party wasn't bad and maybe the best of all, but I could not vote and so I didn't vote. So I think we have the freedom to vote, the responsibility maybe, but we have also the privilege, I think, not to vote. I don't think it's illegal in Canada not to vote. They've tried to bring it in, that it is a must, but I think up to now you are free whether you want to vote or not. And so it makes it a little bit easier. But we must understand that it is still God who sets up authorities. And some of those authorities are just so evil and so bad. If you look through the whole of the history, even of the history of Israel, where Israel was being governed by, by evil nations and evil kings, God ordained that. Even God brought these people to Israel to help them and discipline them because of their waywardness, their spiritual waywardness. And I think then God is still in control. Ultimately, in the big picture, God knows what he is doing. He knows what he is doing today. He knows what he is doing tomorrow. Because the ultimate we will be when Jesus will be put as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords over all the nations. He is over all in control. And you can vote for him now. You don't have to go to a voting booth, but where it is in your own heart. You have to vote for the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Lord Jesus, please be the king of my life. I'd only been a Christian a few weeks when an elderly lady came up to me in my hometown and she said, Toast, tell me, you've become a Christian, you say, but did you really make Jesus king of your life? And I'd never heard this phrase before. Never thought about it. And I was very thankful she did because it started to make me think, is Jesus really king over my life? I've got a choice to make. I have a choice to follow Jesus, even when there is utter darkness all around me. <coughs> God wants to use me in all these situations so I can be a light shining in a dark world. And so I was thinking about the story of three kings. We have to do very fast because my time is going. But three, the first three kings in, uh, for Israel. Now the original idea that God had was for Israel not to have kings. And uh, he had judges. And judges were there when Israel had gone astray uh, spiritually. And uh, other nations came in and dictated over them. And then the nation would cry out to God for helping God would give them a judge. But there came a time when even the judges were not good enough anymore for the nation of Israel. They rejected it. And they said, we want a king like our neighboring uh, kingdoms. And Samuel, the prophet who anointed kings, really felt his nose put out of joint because he thought that they had rejected him. But God said to, to Samuel, no, they've not rejected you, they have rejected me. You are in a bad situation if you reject the king of kings, if you reject the Lord. And so God said, okay, I'll give you kings. But those kings will tax you, and they will set up armies, and they will do a whole lot. It'll be a very expensive proposition. And they won't be a guarantee that you will be free, because you will wander away again. And I will have to send enemy nations to you so that you will be brought back to the land. And so the first king was King Saul. And the name of Saul means prayed for and asked for from God. I think maybe it will be better translation, prayed for and demanded from God because they demanded the king. The second king of Israel was David. His name was Beloved, and he was God's Beloved. He was a man after God's own heart. Wonderful title to have. If you will be a man or woman 
after God's own heart. And then the third king is Solomon, and uh, his name means peace. Now, there are good points to each of these kings and bad points. The good points, Saul, for instance, although he didn't finish very well, but in the beginning he was a very humble man. We are told that Saul, King Saul, was head and shoulders above most people. And if you have uh, difficulty uh, thinking what that looks like, it's me. I'm head and shoulders above most people. But that's where I want to have the comparison stopped, because I don't want to be compared to Saul. But Saul was a tall, big man, handsome. And um, in the beginning, he was very willing to follow God's way. He wasn't keen even of being a king. It's interesting, too, that he was, he was quite humble in the beginning. David, he was a man after God's own heart. That was his strong point, his good point. He really, when he sinned, my wife always says he sinned with all his heart, but he also repented with all his heart. And that's the good thing about King David. And then Solomon. Solomon was known for his wisdom when it came to his good points, but not much else was good. Each king was anointed by God. I find this is a critical, critical kind of um, point in the lives of these men. They were anointed by God. They had equal opportunity to be effective and useful in God's hands. So are you. You don't have to become and wait till God anoints you to be a king. None of us, I would, maybe I can't say it, but I don't think any of us would ever become a king or a queen of a country. Maybe some of the ladies are eligible, and maybe they find, or a husband king finds them, and they can become queens. But it's very few indeed. Most of us will never be a king or a queen. But we are all, we are all there to serve the Lord. We are all there to be used by God. We all need to be anointed by Him. They had equal opportunity, all these men. They each were God's choice, each of these men. You are God's choice. If God has chosen you to be a servant for Him, then He wants to use you. The Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in all they say, do uh, say to you, for they have not rejected you, he said to Samuel, but they have rejected me, but I should not reign over them. And uh, like you will be like the other nations. It's just a very sad story when you read the story of Israel. I, I've just finished reading about a 700 page book. It's very interesting, it's a bit long. Uh, about the history of Jerusalem. And it goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. Ever since David and all the, the troubles they had on the way. War after war after war after war. What we see today happening in Israel is not something new. But um, finally they will overcome. Not that Israel will overcome. I believe the king of kings will overcome. He will establish his new kingdom and you will reign like kings and queens with him in this world. He will establish a new kingdom and that's what the Lord will do. But each of these kings also had spiritual defects. Crises are okay and each one of these kings had a big crisis in their life. Again, it's, we don't have time enough to, to go through all this but they had crisis, but crisis in itself is not bad. If you have a crisis in your life, then it can make you stronger. Your roots will go deeper if you continue crying out to the Lord. Actually, the Lord Jesus himself had many crises in his life, many temptations. He, he didn't struggle, but he had, he had opportunity to reject everything, but he never did. He was faithful to his father. And so it says in the book of James, to consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. 
because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is a double-minded and unstable in all his ways. You know, when I think about the failures of those three kings, I think about Saul, how proud he became, how he started to worship idols like the nation did before him. And so he fell really by the wayside. And he had a deep hatred against David becoming a king. His, his, his hatred for dear David was unbelievable. But David's patience was unbelievably good. That's why I believe he was a man after God's heart. But David also had his moral failures with Bathsheba and he engineered the death of her husband. And then King Solomon, he had his failures. His failures were mainly moral and spiritual failures. He built up idol, idols again in his nation to please his wives. You know what his wives, he, <laughs> I, I find it hard to understand. He prayed for wisdom and God gave him wisdom and yet he married 700 wives. I would have two or three anniversaries every day of <laughs> wedding anniversaries. One a year is quite enough. But he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. You know the wealth he and he, he accumulated, put in 2021 standards, was he was a net, he had a net worth of 2.1 trillion US dollar. I don't know how they worked it out, but you can see according to some of the Old Testament scriptures, the wealth that Solomon had. But he definitely was a fool when he died. He did not show any wisdom. But here we are, God, and it turned his heart away from the Lord. Here we are, you have the chance, the opportunity to serve God. To serve him in a way that he wants you to walk. That he wants you to become more Christ-like. He invites you and say, vote for me. Let me be the king in, in your heart. Vote for me and I will give you myself I will give you the desires of my heart of the heart of Jesus not of our hearts not of the hearts of this world but he wants to give his desires for you he knows what is best for us I find the wonderful verse about the life of David and I finish with that now is that it says in the book of Acts when David had completed his task in his generation, God took him. May this be said for you, that when you do everything possible in your generation to please God, then you're ready for God to take you into eternal glory, where you will reign with him, where you will be reigning with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But while he leaves us here on earth, we have a responsibility to worship him and to serve him. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for this great love that you have showered upon us. The mercy you have for us. That Lord, nothing is too hard for you. That Lord, as we are facing now a time of voting even in our own country, we pray you Lord that your name will continually be glorified. And we ask you, Lord, that you will just shower your blessings upon your church, upon your beloved church, so that we might be fruitful in your service. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen.